former drug kingpin, released a memoir in February of 2022, detailing the events that led to him running the largest high-end marijuana wholesaler on the east coast of the United States while he was still in college. Eric Canori began selling marijuana when he was in 11th grade at a high school in Queensbury, New York. He continued dealing while attending the State University of New York at Plattsburgh. By his early 20s, he'd built his illicit business into a multi-million dollar drug enterprise. In his book, Canori claimed to have smuggled more than $300 million worth of marijuana, leading him to describe his unlawful empire as a Fortune 500 company. In 2012, federal investigators finally caught up with the man and he was ultimately sent to prison for 30 months for marijuana conspiracy. Canori's memoir revealed that he'd been subjected to lighter punishment due to his cooperation with the authorities, which included leading DEA agents into the woods of upstate New York, where he'd hidden $10 million worth of gold bars. Following the release of his book, Canori announced his plans to apply for a license to become a legal marijuana vendor, boasting, I understand the high-end cannabis market on the East Coast probably better than anybody. Number 7. Hardin Street Raid On January the 8th of 2019, the police in Houston, Texas, received a call from a woman named Patricia Ann Garcia, who claimed that her neighbors were engaged in criminal activity involving illicit substances and guns. Based on the information, Officer Gerald Goines obtained a no-knock search warrant for the purported drug house, which was located on Hardin Street. To support his case for the warrant, Goines lied, claiming the department had a confidential informant who'd purchased black tar heroin in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction conducted at the Hardin Street residence. In reality, the police had no such testimony to legitimize Garcia's allegations against her neighbors. Nevertheless, the no-knock raid was carried out on January the 28th, roughly three weeks after the woman's initial call. Upon entering the home, officers shot the resident's dog. According to the Houston Police Department's official reports, they were subsequently met by Dennis Wayne Tuttle, who was armed with a revolver. Gunfire was exchanged and Tuttle was killed. The man's live-in partner, Regina Ann Nicholas, was gunned down by a backup officer after allegedly reaching for a wounded officer's weapon. Investigators seized a small quantity of marijuana and cocaine from the house, but no heroin. The drugs found were described as having been user amounts, not distributor levels. Three months after the raid, the Tuttle and Nicholas families hired a forensic team to reprocess the crime scene. Upon doing so, the private investigators found no evidence that the occupants of the house had fired upon the officers as they entered, as was claimed in the official police report. Furthermore, the forensic team expressed their belief, based on the evidence collected, that the officers had blindly fired through the walls during the raid. A few months later, in November, a federal grand jury returned indictments on federal charges for Officer Goins as well as Officer Stephen Bryant. In connection to the ill-conceived Harding Street raid, a Harris County grand jury further indicted Goins with tampering with government documents and felony murder. As of June of 2021, a total of 11 Houston officers had been indicted. Garcia, meanwhile, pleaded guilty to making the false call leading to the raid and was consequently sentenced to 40 months in federal prison. Number 6. Anaheim Slap House Shortly before 8 a.m. on October the 13th of 2020, the police in Anaheim, California raided an alleged illegal gambling operation that was fronting as a hydroponics business. At least 13 suspects were arrested at the so-called slap house, a phrase that refers to the sound of players slapping the controls of the gambling games, which can be heard outside the business. Police, firefighters and the SWAT team showed up at the building and deployed flashbangs before forcing their way inside. In addition to those taken into custody, more than 70 individuals were detained while investigators sorted things out. 25 of the detainees were cited for various offenses, including drug possession. The 13 suspects arrested faced criminal charges stemming from active warrants, parole and probation violations, as well as gambling violations. While speaking to the media in the raid's aftermath, an Anaheim police sergeant described how the presence of slap houses can, in turn, attract other criminal activity, including violent muggings, drug use, and escorts. An anonymous informant told law enforcement that whenever the owners of the illicit gambling operation would lose money, they'd 
prowl on the town and commit assaults and robberies to recoup their losses. The most recent updates indicated the case's legal proceedings were still ongoing. Number 5. Gary Losh On July the 30th of 2017, British Columbia woman Chelsea Gortier was reported missing to the Abbotsford Police Department by her family. A massive search for the 22-year-old mother of two ensued. Then 17 days after her initial disappearance, Gortier's remains were found near Sylvester Road and Dale Road, northeast of the city of Mission. Five years of investigation left law enforcement with little to go on in their effort to ascertain what exactly happened to the young woman. In September of 2022, however, the case finally experienced new developments. Officers with the Integrated Homicide Investigation Team arrested a man by the name of Gary Losh on suspicion of second-degree murder and interference with a dead body. The 67-year-old man reportedly owned an illegal outdoor marijuana growing operation which Gautier had been a part of in some capacity. The specific nature of the disagreement between Losh and the victim wasn't immediately made clear. The man was held in custody while awaiting a court appearance scheduled for January of 2023. Earlier that month, coroner Laurie Moen released a report detailing how Gautier's official cause of death was determined to be a stab wound to the torso and that her death had therefore been classified as a homicide. Number 4. Corvina House Restaurant In early October of 2022, Florida police raided the Corvina House Restaurant on Coral Way in southwest Miami-Dade. After learning that it was moonlighting as an illegal nightclub, law enforcement initially caught wind of the seafood restaurant's criminal activity through anonymous tips. A sting operation was then set into motion during the course of which undercover officers befriended the nightclub's regulars and ended up purchasing narcotics from the waitresses. Investigators also observed the establishment sell alcohol despite not having a liquor license. During the resulting raid, which was conducted on October the 7th, the police seized cash, firearms, alcohol, and illegal substances including cocaine and MDMA. Eleven suspects were taken into custody, one of whom was identified as 37-year-old Daryl Morjon, the business's owner. All 11 were held at the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center on drug possession and distribution charges. The restaurant was immediately shut down in the wake of the raid. Number 3. California Fix-It Scheme In December of 2022, California officials publicly detailed a scheme to forge the signatures of highway patrol officers on more than 250 Fix-It tickets. The citations in question had reportedly been issued during illegal street racing operations in Los Angeles and Orange Counties. So-called fix-it tickets are given out when a vehicle is in violation for being illegally modified or missing a vital part. If the alleged violator fixes the issue outlined in the document and has a police officer sign off on the corrected infraction, they can avoid facing punishment beyond paying a small fine. But according to the California Highway Patrol, a man named Angel Saeed Sanchez Peralta sold forged police signatures for $300 apiece. He was arrested in August of 2020, at which point law enforcement began looking into his clientele. Investigators determined that 27 individuals had paid Sanchez Peralta to fraudulently sign off on their fix-it tickets, and all of them were consequently arrested. While criminal charges hadn't yet been filed against the 27 suspects, as of the latest developments, Sanchez Peralta had been charged with 33 counts of attempt to file a forged instrument in a public office and one count of attempt to procure or offer a false or forged instrument for record. Number 2. Dexter Lab State troopers raided an illegal cannabis extract lab near Dexter, Oregon on October the 23rd of 2019. Police described the operation as having been set up at an out-of-compliance Oregon Medical Marijuana Program grow site. After serving a search warrant to the property owners, law enforcement recovered 10 firearms, one of which was stolen, and hundreds of pounds of illegally possessed marijuana, as well as two extraction machines valued at approximately $120,000. 
State police also reportedly seized items relating to the manufacture and sale of counterfeit vape cartridges. The authorities had obtained the warrant following a proactive inspection by the Oregon Liquor Control Commission's Medical Marijuana Division. Two suspects were taken into custody during the raid. They both faced charges of unlawful possession of marijuana, unlawful delivery of a marijuana item, and unlawful manufacture of a marijuana item. Before we move on to number one, and just in case your daily true crime cravings haven't been satiated yet, you can stay tuned afterwards to watch our earlier release of Bikers Gone Wrong. Number one, Carla Jacqueline Morales. 20-year-old Carla Jacqueline Morales asked a young man to accompany her to a grassy field near an elementary school in Spring, Texas to smoke marijuana. When 24-year-old Jose Villanueva arrived at the meetup location, however, he was ambushed by machete-wielding members of the notorious MS-13. After being ruthlessly hacked by the assailants, Villanueva tried to crawl away, at which point he was fatally shot with a handgun. The victim had reportedly been hiding from the gang, which accused him of disrespecting them during a rap battle. The scheme to lure Villanueva out into the open was devised, at least in part, by Morales, who then facilitated the setup for her violent co-conspirators. The young woman was eventually arrested on murder charges and prosecutors requested that her bond be set at $250,000. The magistrate judge instead set it at just $100,000, but it was later reduced to $60,000 by a different district court judge. Morales was subsequently freed on the condition that she wear an ankle monitor until she was due back in court for her trial in October of 2021. Just a few days before the trial was scheduled to commence, however, Morales cut off her GPS monitor and absconded. Although she was born in California and had reported ties to Central America, investigators expressed their belief that she might still be in the Houston area. As of the latest updates, her whereabouts remained unknown. Number 7. Brett Chaos Pecci 34-year-old Brett Pecci a notorious ex-biker was taken into custody by Western Australian police on the morning of June the 26th of 2020. He served as a high-ranking member of the Bandidos motorcycle gang for many years, during the course of which he engaged in a variety of criminal activities that led to his arrest on multiple occasions. This particular incident began on June the 24th when Pecci, nicknamed Chaos during his gangster days, threatened two officers, issuing him a police order. The order was connected to a domestic violence incident involving his ex-girlfriend, Ricky Luis. Pecci imitated the cocking of a firearm and pretended to point a gun in the policeman's direction. The authorities' concern over the mock threat intensified after a video surfaced in which Pecci said the phrase, coppers die today, with a shotgun placed beside him. Heavily armed tactical response officers subsequently made their way to Pecci's residence to arrest him. They surrounded his property and used a loudspeaker to demand he exit the house. He eventually came outside and gave himself up without incident. A number of charges were handed down, including threatening to kill, possessing a firearm in circumstances of aggravation, and various police order breaches. The whole situation concluded with him being put behind bars for a year. It wasn't the first time Pecci had been arrested in dramatic fashion. In 2018, 26 police officers surrounded his house while he was barricaded inside videotaping the standoff. Just a few years earlier, the outlaw biker was arrested at Brisbane International Airport over extortion charges after being on the run for two years. Number 6. Liam Scorsese On February the 25th of 2018, a domestic dispute involving a member of the Comanchero Motorcycle Club ultimately led to a deadly police shooting in Brisbane, Australia. 31-year-old biker Liam Scorsese attempted to enter his girlfriend's family residence in a fit of rage after the couple had engaged in a heated argument. He had been locked out of the house and subsequently started banging on the door shouting for his partner, Shirez Beitel, to come out. Beitel and the rest of her family barricaded themselves inside the home and called the police. When the authorities showed up at the scene, they found Scorsese wielding a knife he had stolen from the kitchen. With the weapon in hand, he began to approach the officers, who instructed him to drop the blade and get on the ground. Scorsese refused to heed their instructions, prompting the police to fire a taser at his chest, which did little to subdue him. Scorsese ripped the taser wires from his body and resumed charging the officers. In fear for his and his partner's lives, one of the policemen brandished his gun and fired two shots at the biker, causing him to fall to the ground. 
The officers administered first aid until an ambulance arrived to transport him to Princess Alexandra Hospital. He passed away from his gunshot wounds an hour later. Baytel complained that the police officers dispatched to her house that day had neglected to turn on their body cameras prior to shooting Scorsese. After an inquest into the incident, a coroner suggested officers be equipped with body cams that are automatically activated once their guns are drawn. Number 5. Dustin Linden a man was shot and killed in DuPont, Indiana by a group of five bikers belonging to outlaw motorcycle clubs on June the 22nd of 2021. The victim was 35-year-old Dustin Lindner of Georgetown, Kentucky, who had gotten into an argument with the five suspects after wearing the insignias associated with their gangs, the Pagans and the Warlocks, despite the fact that he wasn't a member of either group. The bikers in question were later identified as David Faulkner, Gary Fletcher, Jason Brewer, Michael Carnuth and Jordan Lowe. After confronting Linda and expressing their displeasure with his tattoos and patches bearing their symbols, they went to his residence in the early morning hours and conducted a home invasion. Police received reports of shots fired shortly thereafter. When officers arrived at the scene, they found Linda lying in the yard with a gunshot wound. He had been shot dead following an altercation with the five bikers, all of whom were apprehended in connection with the incident. Faulkner, Fletcher, Brewer and Carnuth were each charged with murder while Lowe received lesser indictments. Number 4. Michael Davey An associate of the Rebels motorcycle gang was shot dead in a residential driveway in Kingswood, Australia on March the 30th of 2016. Michael Davey, aged 30, was an enforcer for the infamous Outlaw Club and had earned himself the nickname Ruthless. He had a criminal history that included a manslaughter conviction in 2002 when he was just 17 years of age. Despite his checkered past, Davy was looking to escape the violent world of which he was a part after his girlfriend had given birth to a son. Just after midnight on the night of his death, Davy told his girlfriend he was meeting a friend across the street from where they lived. When he walked to the neighboring driveway, he was shot and killed by two fellow rebel members who fled the scene in a getaway car. Witnesses recounted hearing as many as six gunshots, followed by the sound of screeching tires. The shooters had reportedly turned on Davy after word got out that he no longer wanted to be associated with the club. The slain motorcyclist was laid to rest in Western Sydney on April the 8th of 2016. The funeral ceremony was attended by dozens of bikers from all over Australia. In August of 2018, the two perpetrators were identified by the authorities and charged with Davy's murder. They were both already in correctional facilities for other offenses when the charges were handed down. Number 3. Jeremy Harris A 38-year-old Florida man named Jeremy Harris was brutally attacked by a group of angry bikers after accidentally clipping one of their vehicles on January the 9th of 2021. Harris came to an intersection in North Fort Myers that was being blockaded by motorcyclists. He began to berate the stationary bikers for stopping the flow of traffic, just so the rest of their group could skip the red light. Harris then attempted to drive away but came very close to knocking one of the riders off his bike. The bikers then pursued him and surrounded his car at a stoplight. Harris exited his vehicle with a wrench in hand and tried to protect himself but he was ultimately overpowered by the enraged bikers who proceeded to viciously beat and bludgeon him with the tool. Horrified onlookers attempted to break up the altercation but the attackers continued their assault. Harris's skull was fractured during the onslaught and he required 15 stitches in his head. Multiple suspects were arrested following the incident and charged with felony battery. Today's topic was requested by Charlotte Tilson, Mick Spears and Brentley27. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Ben Geppert In September of 2020, an ex-Hells angel by the name of Ben Geppert invaded the home of a 26-year-old man from Broad Beach Waters, Australia and attacked him with a baseball bat over a drug dispute. Geppert, aged 29, had sold the victim $1,500 worth of illegal substances a month prior to the incident, but he was reportedly only given $1,000 in payment. The biker demanded the money he was owed, but on the other side of the argument, the man claimed the drugs he'd been sold were fake. As he continually refused to pay, Geppert texted him a picture of a gun before arriving at his house and beating him to a pulp in his front yard before the eyes of terrified bystanders. At around 11 p.m. that same night, Geppert returned to the man's residence and broke in armed with a baseball bat, which he used to club the man's head. The resulting injuries required 12 stitches to mend. 
The very next day, Geppert returned once again and forced the man to accompany him to get a Rolex watch appraised. The biker was subsequently arrested following a rooftop chase with police officers in the town of Kingscliff. In August of 2021, he was sentenced to three years in prison for the home invasion and assault. The charges were added to the extensive list of Geppert's past offenses. He was also featured in our Hells Angel video regarding an incident in which he'd attacked his girlfriend who, fearing for her life, was forced to jump out of a moving car. He also appeared in a viral video produced by the Queensland Police Service which aimed at stopping new recruits from joining outlawed gangs. Number 1. The 2015 Waco Shootout A violent shootout between rival motorcycle gangs erupted in Waco, Texas on May the 17th of 2015. More than 200 people were gathered inside a Twin Peaks restaurant for a regional meeting of Texas's statewide biker group coalition. The main topics on the gathering's agenda were centered on political rights for motorcyclists. 18 Waco police officers and four Texas state troopers were stationed outside the establishment to monitor the gathering, which had initially started out peacefully. Tensions began to rise between two clubs present at the event, the Bandidos and the Cossacks. The incident that reportedly set off the conflict involved someone getting their foot run over in a parking spot just after noon. By 12.24 p.m., the argument had escalated into an all-out gunfight. Patrons of nearby restaurants ducked for cover under tables and behind cars as gunshots started flying from all sides. The police soon returned fire after being shot at themselves, but no civilians or law enforcement officers were wounded during the incident. However, nine bikers were killed at the scene and 18 others were injured. Police snipers were able to target the armed suspects and bring an end to the gunfire. In the aftermath of the shootout, a total of 177 people were arrested and detained by the authorities, but only one of them was ever brought to trial. Jake Carrizal, president of the Bandidos Dallas chapter, was tried for his involvement in the deadly episode, but his case was ultimately thrown out due to a mistrial. By April of 2019, all of the criminal cases stemming from the Waco shootout had been dismissed. More than 130 civil lawsuits were subsequently filed against various state and local officials by many of the bikers involved in the mass arrest. Thanks for watching. Would you rather become extremely rich through morally questionable business practices that were technically legal or cash in a winning lottery ticket that you watched fall out of a homeless man's pocket? Let us know in the comment section below.